want to drop that in the chat too, Peter. Uh, which one? The IRC. The, the link oh. to the... Uh, I don't have the IRC thing open, so. Okay, hang on a second. I've, I've got it in my closet. I've got it, so I can do it. Uh, what which IRC um, channel is this? Is this Dev Summit? No, it's not. Uh, this is uh, the FreeBSD channel on irc.geekshow.net. Okay, I think that's Slack Gateway. Oh, I don't think it is. Um, oh, it's not. Oh. No, it's yeah. He had another IRC network because we don't have enough in this project. Um, this this. This is the one that's embedded into the live.freebsd.org page. Yes. Um, oh, right, right. So anyone watching on the live stream, which should be active now, um, can join in there. Let me just see. Oh, uh, yes, it looks like it is active. Okay, so our uh, stream is active and we have the recording. So um, welcome everyone who is uh, watching this on the live stream. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you can leave them in the IRC channel or join by the Slack or by the uh, Zoom link that we will paste again um, in there in just a moment. Uh, and other than that, I'll turn it over to Peter and uh, John. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Um, so FreeBSD has a number of office hours for various topics. Uh, we thought we might as, might as well grab one for the BIF hypervisor. Uh, so this is the first go at doing this. Um, we're probably not too sure what the format should really be like. Um, we're certainly open to feedback, feedback on what time it should be, uh, what the content should be. Um, but anyway, we'll just plow ahead with this one. Um, there should be a link uh, to what we're going to talk about today in the IRC channel. So basically, um, we'll just have a bit of an intro. Uh, we're going to talk about um, some notable commits that have gone in the past month. I guess in theory, if we did this meeting once a month, we'll go through you know, kind of what's happened in the last month. Uh, we'll talk about work that's going to be uh, coming up. Um, open for review or in planning or that somebody is working on. Uh, we're going to have a couple of minor talks. Uh, Mark has one on the SMR work that he's been doing. Um, I have a small one on the KBM uh, unit test work. John may have a secret one up his sleeve. And um, after that, we'll just leave it open for um, Q&A from the audience, similar to um, other beehive office hours. Um, so I guess we can just do a short round of introductions here. Um, my name is Peter Green. I'm a FreeBSD committer. I do most of my work um, on the beehive hypervisor. Um, over a few frames to my right is John Ball. Hi, I'm John and I do various things in FreeBSD. <clears throat> and one of the roles I've played, especially over the past uh, couple of years, is helping coordinate different work and stuff going into Beehive and helping with the re reviewing things and so forth. Um, so over from John, we have Mark Johnson. Hi, I'm Mark. Um, I'm a source committer as well, working on quite a few different things. Um, I haven't done much substantial work on Beehive, but I did uh, some the aforementioned patch, uh, which I'll be talking about uh, shortly. Um, and uh, I've, I've done a few minor things. I certainly make quite good use of Beehive, so I'm, I'm happy to see it make progress. Um, helping out with this, uh, we have an honorary um, 
Remember on this call, Jason Tubner? Uh, hi, my name is Jason Tubner. Uh, I work for a large healthcare um, not for profit provider in uh, Melbourne or Victoria and New South Wales in Australia. Uh, we're a large consumer of beehives. So if there's something that, <laughs> that's a, a problem in beehive, we'll, we'll have certainly come against it and uh, knocked on it and, uh, and we help with a fair bit of testing. So yeah, thanks, Peter. And um, of course we have Ed and Deb from the FreeBSD Foundation who've been good enough to set up this call. Okay, so um, first off the list um, is what's some uh, recent work that's been done in Beehive that's kind of notable. Um, there hasn't been a huge amount of activity, um, and I guess towards the end of the year, we're getting a few changes in. Um, I think a notable one is, um, I guess what I call SMR, TLB, EPT, TLB shoot down. Uh, Mark is actually gonna talk a little bit about that um, coming up. Uh, we've had some commits to enable KBM unit tests for Beehive. I'll also talk about that a little bit coming up. Um, a commit as part of the save restore work. Uh, we've had support for some extra devices. So save restore now works with AHCI, Vertio Random, and the XHCI controller. And uh, another one, there's been a number of commits that help with 64-bit PCI pass-through. So uh, in particular, um, GPUs uh, generally show up as 64-bit uh, devices. Beehive has sort of had some rough support for that, um, but it didn't work on uh, particular machines. Um, so um, Caustic from FreeBSD has done a fair bit of work to try to fix some of those limitations. Um, there's still some more work to go, but uh, this is kind of part of a much longer effort to try to get GPU pass through working for Beehive. Um, probably the next uh, thing, which is work that's not really um, in the FreeBSD tree, but it's very tightly integrated with Beehive, and that is firmware. Um, so Beehive uses um, a build of the Tyanacore um, open source EDK2 firmware. Um, previously, we've taken a snapshot of that, and it's quite old. It's like from 2014, and that had a number of changes that were specific to Beehive. Um, that was never really updated. Uh, so recently the diffs between that and the mainstream Tynacore have been taken out and merged into upstream Tynacore. Uh, this work was done by Bex Cran. Um, the advantage of that is that uh, since Beehive is part of upstream, in theory, any change that happens to upstream, we can pick up immediately. Um, there seems to be a lot of active work happening in uh, EFI these days. Um, we haven't yet integrated that back um, into FreeBSD. Um, there's still a few bugs that need to be sorted out, but the goal is that um, once that port's updated, uh, we can update as often as uh, upstream EFI updates, which is seems to be about four times a year now. Um, so we should have the access to the most recent um, EFI firmware. Um, next on the list is upcoming work that's in progress. Probably the most significant is there's a very large patch set that has been put out for ARM V8 support in Beehive. Um, there's uh, a lot more ARM V8 developer boards available. 32-bit um, ARM seems to be sort of dying off. Uh, ARM V8 itself is becoming continually more important um, it has hardware support for virtualization, um, not too dissimilar from how it works on Intel and AMD. Um, there's been work done on this for a couple of years now by um, University Polytechnica in Bucharest. And they submitted a very large patch set uh, that supports hardware virtualization um, on a number of um, fairly commonly used ARM V8 platforms. Um, that's a pretty big review and it's going to take uh, a long time to get through. 
another large batch set is for uh, Intel GPU pass through, and this is for integrated uh, GPU on Intel desktop systems. Uh, that's also a fairly large patch set and it required changes in um, other parts of the system. So it's uh, making its way slowly into mainline. Uh, another recent one we've had is some fixes for VNC client interoperability and also some performance improvements. Uh, the Beehive, so the VNC server that's built into Beehive um, is fairly minimalistic. Uh, it had problems with um, a number of fairly popular VNC clients. Uh, so there's a patch set out that fixes pretty much all the issues that I've had with VNC clients. So in particular, the Mac OS built-in client now works. Um, Tiger VNC works without any performance problems. Um, it also reduces the CPU usage that's required. And the mouse um, interactivity is much better than what had been there previously. Um, that's pretty much uh, ready to go. In fact, maybe I'll even uh, submit it during uh, this call. Um, another um, bit of work that's upcoming is Vertio 1.1 support. Um, this is mainly guesswork, not so much beehive work. Um, Brian Benninger, who did all the Verdi work in FreeBSD, has returned as a committer, and he has a fairly large patch set um, that adds 1.1 support um, for Verdio guests. Uh, so hopefully that'll be going in fairly soon. Um, John, did you have anything else for um, work that's upcoming? Um, I know the the folks at Bucharest have some more save restore stuff in the pipeline, um, as well as some other fixes from some other folks. Um, but in particular, the current save restore is kind of limited in that it doesn't support multiple instances of the same device. And so one of their patches fixes that. Um, but they've also had a student working this semester on um, redoing the format of the file that, that, that is used for saving restore. So instead of just kind of arbitrary blobs of binary data, it will instead be a JSON file that saves things as kind of register values with st in strings in JSON so you can kind of edit it and also so it gives us room to have it be separated from the ABI internals of Beehive. Um, that's continuing to work. That's a, a continuing work in progress. Um, and I know I have some work to redo how Beehive does its in configuration. That's been in Fabricator for quite a while now. And I've been working for the past couple of weeks writing man pages documenting how the configuration stuff works. And I'm getting closer to having it all documented. Um, uh, I'm probably forgetting some other stuff, but those are the ones that I can think of off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, I mentioned earlier that um, one of the changes that had gone in in the past month or so was um, uh, some SMR work that was done for Beehive. So uh, Mark has a, it's a bit of a talk on that. So I might um, throw over to Mark and he can describe that work. Sure, let me get those. Uh... Slides up. Um, yeah, so um, I was asked to speak about this in about five or 10 minutes, which, which isn't a huge amount of time. So I'm just gonna kind of blaze through it. Um, basically, we have this synchronization primitive in FreeBSD in the FreeBSD kernel called SMR. Um, and I recently made use of it in Beehive to, to solve a, or to, to plug a kind of hole in our uh, algorithms which are used to invalidate uh, guest um, uh, guest mappings. So uh, I'm going to give some background on that and, and talk about the problem and uh, talk about SMR a little bit and then uh, show how it's integrated. I think this is not super interesting for, for users of Beehive, but more for uh, uh, developers. In particular, it adds a, a kind of general purpose synchronization primitive to Beehive itself that can be used to synchronize different vCPUs. Um, and I think that might have uh, more applications down the road. Um, so Really briefly, uh, page table virtualization is one of the sort of tasks that any hypervisor uh, implements. Um, so uh, up until I think 10 or 12 years ago with Nehalem in, in Intel and, and Barcelona and AMD, uh, there was no support for, for virtualization of, uh, of page tables, which are used to translate uh, uh, virtual addresses to, to host physical addresses. Uh, what that basically meant was that hypervisors had to 
intercept all modifications done by the guest operating system to its own page tables to reflect those into the page tables visible to the, uh, to the host CPU. Um, that's a, a fairly complicated, uh, complicated thing to implement. Um, and it's, it's obviously fairly, uh, uh, secure, you know, if, if it's not done correctly, it has fairly large security implications. Um, so it's, it's quite tricky. And um, so Beehive was, was implemented partly because uh, uh, those, those aforementioned CPUs started to gain hardware support for, for virtualizing the MMU. Um, so in <clears throat> Intel terminology, this is called EPT. Um, and in AMD, it's RVI, or I think earlier called NPT, nested page tables. And the basic idea is instead of uh, having a, a single a set of page tables that you use to translate from virtual to physical addresses, you introduce two, uh, two stages of translation. In the first stage, which executes uh, within the guest, you translate from a guest virtual address to a guest physical address. And uh, the second stage, which is managed by the hypervisor, the VMM, the VMM uh, translates from uh, guest physical addresses to host physical addresses. Um, <clears throat> so the, the upshot of this is that it uh, makes implementation of a, of a hypervisor a lot simpler because you don't really have to, uh, you don't have to intercept all of these guest, uh, guest modifications to page tables. Um, you kind of just maintain page tables, which look a lot like native page tables, uh, and, uh, and, and your hypervisor um, doesn't, doesn't require all that much extra code. Um, there are some downsides to it. Um, it makes TLB misses a fair bit more expensive because now there's, there's extra stages to the translation. There's more information that has to be cached. Um, and so a TLB miss means that we have to do more lookups than, than uh, uh, you might have to with shadow page tables. Um, and you know, uh, to, to properly implement this, you need some new microarchitectural state that has to be managed by the hypervisor. Um, and that, of course, interacts with, with everything else that the hypervisor has to do. Um, so you know, TLBs, when running in uh, VMX non-root mode, to use Intel's terminology, so when, when a guest is executing, it, it creates TLB entries, uh, uses the TLB as, as you'd kind of expect. Um, there's, there's a bit of extra state. So when, uh, when a guest runs, uh, it gets assigned uh, an ASID or a VPID, basically a unique identifier. Uh, it gets assigned by the, the hypervisor. And all TLB entries created while running with that particular uh, identifier um, get tagged with that identifier. And that makes it a lot easier to uh, switch in and out of guest execution or switch between different VMs without, uh, without invalidating all of the TLB entries. Um, associated with it. Um, so there's, there's a few different cases where, you know, uh, hypervisors and Beehive in particular need to do these kinds of uh, invalidations. Um, so because uh, the identifier is assigned per CPU, when migrating to a new CPU, you generally need to, uh, um, you need to invalidate uh, translations that might've been left over from a, from a different VM or a different virtual CPU that was using the same host CPU. Um, it's, uh, in, in some cases, it's necessary to invalidate uh, guest TLB entries in order to do uh, accurate page referencing. So uh, Beehive integrates fairly cleanly with FreeBSD's uh, virtual memory management system. Um, and so in particular, we, we have uh, processes for identifying which pages have been recently used so that we can implement LRU. Um, and to do that, we need to uh, shoot down guest TLB entries um, when, when we want to, uh, when we want to uh, refresh the, the access bit on a particular page. And this, this is also um, the way uh, uh, live migration might be implemented as well. So when, when migrating a, a virtual machine to another host, uh, you want to accurately track modifications uh, by the guest to its memory. And uh, you need to use the, uh, you, you need to, be able to uh, invalidate TLB entries to do that. And more recently, um, we've also wanted to be able to relocate device mappings uh, as part of the implementation of, of PCI pass-through. Um, so there's some cases where the hypervisor, where Beehive wants to um, unmap a particular region from, from the guest and, and map it somewhere else. And so to do that properly, you need to be able to invalidate uh, TLB entries referencing the old mapping. Um, so here's a bit of pseudocode which kind of describes or tries, tries to illustrate the way this, this actually looks. 
in practice. So the, the, the function on the bottom VM run is the sort of inner loop of Beehive. Uh, so when it starts to run a guest, it disables interrupts after loading a, a global generation counter, which I'll speak about in a, in a second. Um, but basically it uses the generation counter to see if it needs to flush the TLB. Um, and after that, it uh, enters guest execution, executes guest instructions until something causes it to exit, um, at which point it uh, enables interrupts again, uh, tries to handle the, the source of the exit. If that's possible, it'll continue executing the guest. If not, it'll basically bounce the exit out to, uh, to the user space behind process for, for home processing. Um, so when some agent in the kernel, say the page daemon, or something performing live migration or, or Beehive itself wants to invalidate uh, a guest mapping. Uh, the algorithm it used to use was basically, okay, increment this uh, uh, global generation counter and then raise an IPI on all of the guest, uh, all, all of the CPUs that are executing this particular guest or the, the guest corresponding to the, uh, uh, to the mapping. Um, so this works because uh, raising an IPI on, on a CPU that's executing uh, uh, in executing guest instructions will cause it to exit and, and return control to the host. And at which point the, the host will um, handle the interrupt and restart the loop. At that point, it will see that the, uh, the TLB invalidation generation has changed, flush the TLB before uh, re-entering uh, the guest. So, I mean, there's, there's quite a few details here that are omitted and I've mostly been using Intel terminology in this because that's what I'm more familiar with, but uh, that, that's the sort of basic picture. Um, so you can see I added a, an XXX comment. Um, the previous implementation uh, didn't actually synchronously wait for guests to exit, uh, or rather didn't wait for host CPUs to exit the guest uh, before continuing. So what that meant was there is in principle a window during which uh, the, the kernel, the host kernel thinks that an IPI or a, that a TLB invalidation is completed, but it's, it's possible for guests to be executing instructions. Um, in practice, this window is going to be fairly small, uh, because there's, there's not a lot of sources for delay when handling IPIs. Um, but in principle, the, the message bus used by the hardware to pass IPIs to different CPUs can become congested. There's no guarantee that, uh, there isn't a, a prolonged window where where guests continue to execute even when the when the host kernel thinks that their uh, uh, host kernel thinks that all of the the corresponding TLB entries have been invalidated, and even if that's not true today, it might be true in, in five or ten years. It's hard to say. Uh, so this was uh, uh, a bug that we sort of found by by code inspection while looking at uh, looking at the uh, TLB invalidation algorithms uh, holistically. Um, so to, to fix that, I, I made use of a fairly new synchronization primitive in FreeBSD called SMR. Uh, so SMR is uh, an instance of an SMR algorithm, which is a bit confusing. So SMR generally refers to a family of algorithms which perform safe memory reclamation. So the general picture is you'd have some shared data structure with uh, a lot of readers doing lookups within that data structure. Every once in a while, a writer wants to remove an entry. And the problem is to do so without, uh, without sort of introducing the traditional problems of reader-writer uh, mutexes. In, in the sort of traditional pattern, you'd use a reader-writer lock where uh, you, multiple readers are allowed to execute the critical session, whereas only one writer at a time is permitted to execute. And when there's a writer, no readers are permitted. So the problem with that is it, uh, is it blocks, um, is, is that updates to the data structure block readers. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah, and, and in a lot of cases, that's, that's not a huge problem, but you can think about it, uh, for example, with say a, a very busy firewall. Um, you have a bunch of rules that are used to process incoming packets. Most of the time, those rules are static. Um, every once in a while, maybe the administrator modifies those rules and, and triggers a reload of them. Um, so you have this kind of short period where the rules that are used uh, to process incoming traffic are being updated, but um, if readers are blocked, then you're going to you're going to see a latency spike. Um, before, there, there was there was nothing blocking uh, processing of incoming packets, but now there's this window where, in order to do that, you have to wait for the rules to be updated. So SMR algorithms try to try to deal with that by permitting 
readers and writers to operate uh, concurrently. And the idea is that the, uh, the writers use, use a mechanism to determine whether any readers possibly have references to a, to a data structure that's about to be deleted. And if so, waits for those readers to finish before it goes ahead. Uh, but it does so in a non-blocking manner. Um, so we actually have a couple of implementations of this in, in the FreeBSD kernel. One's called SMR, the other's called Epoch. Um, they're, they're fairly similar. Um, SMR is specialized to the uh, kernel slab allocator, which is called UMA. Um, and it has some properties that uh, make it fairly efficient for that purpose. In particular, it allows you to amortize the cost of, um, of, of performing a write in the sense that you can delete multiple data structures, um, kind of collect them all together, and then wait for all readers accessing any of those data structures to, uh, to finish before you proceed. Um, so the, the basic API is fairly simple. Readers uh, call uh, SMR enter and SMR exit to denote sections where they're potentially accessing some shared data structure. Writers use um, SMR advance to advance a, a global sequence counter and can later use SMR wait to wait for all readers uh, that have observed a particular sequence counter uh, to, to call SMR exit. So the, the application of SMR uh, to Beehive was to basically bracket all guest execution with SMR read sections. So you can see I took the, uh, the pseudocode that I had in the previous slide and added a couple of extra calls. So in, in VM run, just before we're about to uh, enter uh, execution of the guest, we enter an SMR uh, read section. And once guest execution is completed, we exit. And then when invalidating TLB entries, uh, we, make, uh, we make use uh, of, of the SMR sequence number to, to wait for all pending guest executions to finish. So this adds the, the kind of desired uh, synchronous wait at the end of the TLB invalidation operation which is, allows us to kind of safely continue um, and, and, and under the assumption that, that no guest CPUs are, are continuing to, uh, to reference those uh, now stale TV entries. Um, so again, like this is, this is all fairly internal to Beehive itself. Uh, users hopefully won't see any, any difference. Um, uh, the, the performance overhead of, of SMR enter and exit is fairly small. It's basically a single atomic operation, which is uh, quite small relative to the, uh, to the cost of all the setup and teardown that goes into uh, uh, VM enter and VM exit operations. Um, but it also adds us, uh, you know, a, a fairly general purpose synchronization primitive. So now any, any agent in Beehive that wants to apply some updates, some global updates to the VM state and wait for all guests to do a, to perform a VM exit, VM enter uh, combo has, uh, has, has this kind of primitive that can do that. It's fairly lightweight and, uh, and flexible. Um, so at the moment, it's only used for TLB invalidation, but I'm curious to see if over the next couple of years, so uh, we find some additional uses for it. And um, that's all I had to, to, to say on that particular topic, but uh, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, actually, do are there any questions that have popped up during the talk? I don't see any on the uh, IRC channel. Um, I had some questions for you, but I'll wait till the later uh, QA session. Okay, sure. Um, John, did you want to talk a little bit about the config work that you've been doing? Um, I don't have a lot. To say, I guess there's a review on Fabricator that describes what the work does and kind of how it works. Um, internally, it just tries to store all of Beehive's configuration information in a like syscall libs would be kind of like a tree of key value pairs, and then it tries to all of the Beehive itself now kind of before as it was processing command line options, command line arguments rather, it would actually do the actions to instantiate things. And now instead it's kind of split up into like a parsing phase where command line options or configuration files can write values into this kind of 
tree of config values. And then later, once all that's done, then it actually, Beehive itself will start walking the tree and deciding what to do based off of that. So you can apply, you can have templates, then like, you know, if you want to, you can use multiple config files to kind of build what the resulting, resulting system looks like. Um, I have converted all of the like device models inside of Beehive and whatnot to use it. It appears to work in my limited testing. Um, and the last thing I'm working on right now is just um, documenting it fully, in particular, documenting what all those config nodes are. Um, right now, for in terms of config files, just as more of a proof of concept, it has a it supports a very simple flat config file where you have name equal value pairs as lines. But there's also room to write a, a kind of richer, more user friendly UCL config format in front of it that just has a parser that parses the UCL file and then writes the right configuration information. And I haven't started on that at all. I know there's existing an existing review that had a UCL config file, and maybe some of that can be reused in terms of the syntax. Um, but this gives us the bones to allow us to do that. And talking with some of the other folks, like over in Alumos land and so forth, they find this kind of model helpful, where you can kind of have templates you start with and then use uh, command line options. Like a, there's a, a new command line option to allow you to set an arbitrary value. And you can say, so if you want to have a template that defines a basic setup and then define some specific values in the command line that override certain things in the config. Uh, one of the neat things it does do, I think it's neat, it allows you to define your own arbitrary variables and use the value of those variables and other variables that Beehive knows about. So for example, you can have, you can use the name of the VM as part of the path for the backing store for the file. So for example, on my laptop over here, um, I have a, all my beehives basically have a Z-ball. All my VMs rather have a Z-ball that's named after the name of the VM. So I can use a single config file where the path for the block device has the VM name variable as a reference. And I can reuse that same config file with different VMs and just the VM name alone makes it pick the right path. So that has a little bit of flexibility like that. Um, I'm hoping I can finish the man page updates I need to do and get it into really commit shape um, the next week or so. It's just taken a while to write it all, but I'm getting near the end. All right, looking forward to that. Um, I mentioned earlier that there was uh, one other bit of work uh, that had gone in in the last month and that was support for KVM unit tests. Um, so I just have a short presentation about that and then we'll flip over to um, QA. Let me just pull this up. All right, so what are the KVM unit tests? So for people that don't know, KVM is, stands for Kernel Virtual Machine. It's the um, type two hypervisor that's built into Linux. Um, so the unit tests are a way to try to um, come up with the, the smallest possible operating system that you can run as a guest and then inside that, you can write tests that uh, exercise um, very low level hypervisor features. It's designed re you know, really to test VTX or um, AMD SVM features. It's not designed to test, uh, for example, device models or um, uh, higher level features. Um, it was originally designed for x86 on Linux, although there's been a lot of work in recent times to get it to work on ARM v8, System 390, and also PowerPC. Um, what the test is, it's a very small, I guess you'd call it a kernel, but it's in multi-boot format. And it relies on having a serial port and one special device, which is used to communicate test results or to power off the virtual machine um, and a couple of other minor things, uh, generate and interrupt, for example. Um, this is maintained outside of the Linux source tree. And I just have a link to um, the Git repo for that. Uh, so while this was actually designed for Linux, it's kind of a very useful thing in general. Um, so it would seem pretty useful to try to get this to work with Beehive. So the first part was that the images are in multi-boot format. It's not ELF, it's not a flat image. Uh, multi-boot is quite simple. Um, and 
luckily enough, the Grub Beehive build actually has uh, support for multi-boot in it. Um, since it's such a simple for, uh, format, it'd be quite easy to integrate that into Beehive itself. In fact, Xhive already has a multi-boot loader. So um, if it turns out that um, keeping this going in Grub Beehive is too hard, it's fairly easy to extract the code out of Xhive and just pull that back into Beehive itself. Um, the customizer device is also very simple. Um, Beehive has a framework for adding um, devices. Um, so uh, Adam Fenn contributed um, the support for this, and that's now been uh, integrated into FreeBSD. Um, so this is really um, a tool for developers. Um, most kind of low-level feature development in Beehive, certainly at least from my perspective, is done by getting a guest operating system, and usually that's FreeBSD. You go and do some kernel changes if you need to debug something. Um, it's fairly slow process. Um, usually you have to enable tracing and the hypervisor itself to try to pick up changes that have been done. However, if you can have a very tiny operating system that builds basically instantaneously and you can write specific tests to test the feature, uh, you really reduce um, the kind of turnaround on uh, doing changes in the hypervisor. Um, the other advantage you get is that the code that you write to develop the feature can generally be kept as a regression test in case somebody wants to change something or in case that your feature has impacted another feature. Um, for non-developers, it's kind of a useful tool just because you can just run a suite of tests and make sure that everything is still okay. So where this comes into play is if there's a new um, release of Intel VTX on a new hardware platform and you wanna make sure that Beehive runs okay, you can actually kind of run a regression test and make sure that things are still all right. Um, also, because it has more than just x86 support um, for Beehive ARM development, which is kind of you know a new feature, um, having this available uh, is much better than having to just do the old school method of just continuously running guest OSs and trying to work out why they're failing. Um, it's still early days with this yet. Uh, there's quite a lot of test failures um, in running the standard Linux test suite. Um, it's hard to know if they're actual bugs or if they're just things that aren't applicable. For example, there's a whole lot of 16-bit code tests that seem to be designed to exercise software 16-bit emulation, which doesn't exist in Beehive. But it just takes a lot of time just to comb through all the failures and work out what is a genuine failure and what can just be commented out in the test suite. Uh, we don't have a port for the test suite yet. Um, we just have basically a set of divs. So it'd be nice to have a package that somebody could install and run. Um, very recently, um, the KVM unit test people have kind of opened up their repository for uh, non-KVM uh, use cases. So the very small number of changes that have been put in for FreeBSD can easily be upstreamed, I think. And that'd be nice rather than having to maintain a whole lot of diffs uh, against their code base. Um, and of course, uh, we can probably write a whole bunch of Beehive specific tests uh, that may not be applicable to KVM, uh, but would be useful for exercising Beehive functionality. So that's all I had for that. Um, all right, so uh, I guess from now on, we can just open it up to uh, general QA from the audience and see if we can uh, answer what's thrown at us. Well, I can actually start it off. So I, I had a question for Mark. So you mentioned in your talk that um, you use Beehive a lot. Uh, did you want to um, just quickly talk about how you actually use it? 
Uh, so I, I use it mainly for um, development purposes. So for actual FreeBSD development, um, <clears throat> I have a workflow where I, I use a script to create um, a, just a simple disk image from my source tree and uh, I boot that and, and I have scripts again, fairly hacky to install and build uh, new test kernels fairly easily. So it lets me do a lot of kinds of kernel development without having to wait, you know, five minutes for a reboot. Um, <clears throat> things like, um, you know, kernel dumps work very reliably. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's not sort of a traditional, traditional use for this kind of thing, but I mean, it's, it's, you know, uh, I, I think it speeds up my, my development process by a huge amount. Um, lately I've been playing more with, um, using, uh, using beehive to, to run windows so I can, uh, hopefully ditch virtual box for, for playing games and so on, but, uh, I haven't gotten very far with that yet. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I use it every day just as part of my kind of day-to-day -day development workflow. I'm using it right now for, for working on the kernel address sanitizer, which is basically a, a subsystem that tries to detect use after freeze in a, in a precise manner in the kernel. So uh, basically I'm running tests, crashing the kernel, debugging it, rebooting and so on. And, and this kind of loop behind is very useful. Yeah, I used the similar type setup for, especially working on ZFS. Uh, you want to be able to unload the ZFS kernel module and load it again uh, after you make a change without rebooting, obviously. Uh, and UFS tends to mess things up if you crash it repeatedly <laughs> uh, in a not nice way. So I've been using um, Beehive with the NFS root, uh, using a combination of a recipe John had on his blog and some stuff I got from Marius Zaborski. So uh, on my big build machine with 40 cores, I can make dester equals a directory that's the NFS point that this VM is going to boot off of. So the make install world goes really fast because I'm writing to a local file system from my host. And then the Beehive can reboot and boot off that kernel, uh, but be running off not uh, ZFS root so that I can load and unload the ZFS module repeatedly as I try different things. And if I crash it, uh, you know, NFS isn't going to go inconsistent because uh, all the state is on the host. Yeah, I've been meaning to try and switch to an NFS route as well, but I, I just haven't spent the time to update my scripts. I forgot to mention the other the other thing I use it for a lot is syscaller, which is uh, another sort of bug finding, kernel bug finding tool, um, which runs a fuzzer against, a coverage guided fuzzer against the kernel, um, and, and again, tries to crash it. So I, I extended syscaller to support, so it, it, it can, it, sort of implements a VM manager and, and supports a number of different hypervisors like uh, QMU and, and various uh, uh, cloud uh, cloud providers. And, and as of a couple of years ago, I guess at this point, it, it can use Beehive as well. The one issue I did run into was um, uh, because syscaller crashes the kernel very frequently and, and as I noted, that tends to corrupt the file system over time. It tries to, it wants to use a, a fresh snapshot of the of the uh, template disk image on each boot, and um, not supporting QCOW2 or any kind of you know disk image snapshot functionality meant that I that I implemented it using uh, ZFS ZFS clones. So each uh, VM starts off of a of a clone of a snapshot um, of a, of a disk image, and after uh, after it crashes or, or Cisco wants to reboot it, it just kind of throws away the uh, throws away the clone and creates a new one for the, for the subsequent boot. Do we have anybody willing to ask questions via Zoom? Well, Jason had um, one in our yeah. ask him in Zoom since he's here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's cool. Um, with uh, 13 on the horizon, um, obviously there's uh, a fair bit of work still going on in um, head. Um, what uh, testing should consumers do for the upcoming features uh, uh, pending the release of 13? Oh, so the one one I had was um, VNC client testing. So with the change that I'm about to check in, um, just uh, make sure that VNC is um, functioning and, and hopefully that it's better than what it was before.
And I suppose, as always, you know, make sure your favorite guest works. <laughs> Yeah, on that, we uh, we do testing across multiple guests. So we use Windows Server 2016, Windows Server 2019, OpenBSD, whatever's currently being released, and um, Ubuntu LTS of uh, the uh, two flavors of the in support at the time. So that gives us a good uh, groundwork of uh, any of the, the particular areas that are, are going on. Um, in the development of uh, Beehive. So it, we've used it to pick up um, CPU flags and all sorts of stuff in the past. So um, yeah, that's that's what we do to uh, make sure that it's working for our environment because that's really basically the three operating systems that we use as guests within inside Beehive. Uh, yeah, I guess on that, just with Linux, um, I have a future project to try to boot um, Linux kernels as soon as they're released. Uh, we did have a problem a few years back where we weren't doing that too often. And um, we ended up with like a six month window where new Linux kernels didn't work. Um, so I definitely want to make sure that doesn't happen again. Um, generally, the um, distros pick it up fairly quickly, like I usually run Arch which there's not that much of a delay between a Linux kernel release and when it makes it into something that you can just download and install. Um, but I'd like to pick it up even earlier than that. So basically the instant that there's a new kernel, we can have like a CI type test that just picks it up and boots it and makes sure that it works. Yeah, I could uh, bring that into um, my testing portfolio. Uh, Arch, uh, um, it's not something that we use, um, but it's something that you can always have running in the background, especially as a ZFS snapshot. And then, you know, you can um, upgrade it and roll back if required. So, yep, no, that's fine. So, so how's uh, the USB pass-through coming? Uh, are you for asking webcams? me, Alex? Yes, for, for webcams. <laughs> right, so I think uh, UPB apparently are working on that. Um, also, um, Marco, the guy that contributed um, a lot of the VNC changes, um, he has expressed interest in that. So um, uh, I think there's a bunch of people that are going to be looking at it. Um, I think webcams is actually kind of hard, you know, it's um, isochronous data coming in and all of a sudden you're running through a lot more layers of software that are introducing jitter. Um, so uh, that one could be kind of tough. It would be nice though for things like uh, running a Linux guest to program an FPGA board because some of those go over USB. And that would, that would probably work fine through pass through. I've done it with pass through with like a Linux guest on, Mac, on a on virtual box on a Mac before. So that would be an interesting one. Uh, yeah, one of the things that I was looking at was to try to have disconnected USB. So the emulation would actually live external to Beehive um, just in a daemon and it would just use a Unix domain socket to proxy the um, USB um, data. Uh, so then you could dynamically attach um, to Beehive. So it'd be the equivalent of like inserting a memory stick. And then, um, and or network devices. I mean, basically it'll give you kind of live attach and detach. Um, but that's, it's sort of orthogonal to USB pass-through, but in theory that daemon could then, you know, talk directly to UGen and then could proxy that. So my thinking was that rather than have a separate daemon, you actually just have a different version of Beehive because you already have all the back ends in there. So this is just yet another piece that attaches into USB. Uh, here's one that came up the other day. Is there a graceful way to shut down the VM that isn't killed 
dash term? Like, is there a beehive CTL to trigger a soft power off? I know no. there's force power off and force reset, and you can do it with uh, by killing the PID, but being able to do it from beehive CTL based on the name of the VM would be much nicer. I think signals because that's kind of the equivalent of pushing a button. Um, so, <clears throat> one of the yeah, like for, <laughs> for the normal use case, it made sense that, you know, just nicely kill the beehive and it shuts down or, you know, kill minus nine and it, and it gets killed. Uh, but when you're trying to do more scripted things and, you know, if you have 10 VMs running, it's easier to be able to say beehive CTL nicely shut down this name rather than having to map the name back to the pit. It's a little more complicated, but <clears throat> kind of doable now. Um, one of the things the Save Restore work brought in was a Unix domain socket that lives in Beehive that Beehive Cuddle talks to to request a snapshot. Um, I think there's a little on the wire protocol that Unix domain socket might need a little bit of refinement. I think like it passes the VM name when she is redundant, for example, right now. Um, but one of my thoughts has been. Uh, to clean up some of the stuff around the Unix domain socket, and then we can start using it for other messages besides just um, save and restore. But then you would be able to send different messages to Beehive, and that would then it would, once you've done that, then it's probably easy to add that to Beehive Cuddle. But currently, the Beehive Cuddle doesn't really talk to, aside from the save and restore. And prior to that, Beehive Cuddle doesn't talk to Beehive; it talks to the kernel and asks the kernel to do things. And all of the handling of the, like the, the signal and so forth is actually done in the user space hypervisor, not in the kernel bits. So you need a way for Beehive Kernel to directly talk to the user space hypervisor to do things like that. Um, so now we kind of have an initial stab at that. Uh, but that's the avenue that would allow you to do that. But it needs more work to get through. And so I guess the same would apply to things like, I want to change which CD is in the CD drive. Yes, um, or like one of the things I wanted to work on and didn't when I was working on PCI hot plug, it, it should be really easy um, to do kind of generic surprise PCI Express hot plug on Beehive, uh, except for the fact that we have to emulate PCI to PCI bridges is the, is the only really kind of annoying painful part. But then over the same socket, you could send admin remove messages so you could add remove devices at runtime. Um, and it could be objective CD, but it could also be here's a brand new device that just shows up, like for Vert.io devices and so forth that aren't HCI. Right, uh, like I want to add an extra network interface or... Yes, exactly. Uh, and so the Unix domain socket we now have is the right bones to build that on top of, but we need some more work to get there. Yeah, I think um, VMware ESX actually has guest tools to help with shutdown. Hmm. And... That's, I think that's something you want to avoid at all costs. Um, but for that particular case, it's hard to do it properly without something like that. If the guest supports it, the ACPI um, shutdown that uh, you can do um, from external to a guest will gracefully shut that down if the guest supports the ACPI pass um, interrupts. VMB, yeah, but... VMB Hive does that. I think Alan's question is he wants to read uh, Beehive Cuddle shut down foo um, and not have to SSH into the guest and ask it to run power off or shut down minus P now or something like that, where the guest calls the S5 method that actually shuts down. Um, and so he wants, it, he wants the equivalent of the kill term signal, but he wants it to not be a signal um, in particular because you may have, you may need more permissions to run the, the kill term than to run Beehive Cuddle, or you may feel better about giving sudo Wow. And maybe you can do it by name instead of having to use some kind of horrific PS grepping thing to find what the pit is of Beehive for your given VM. I think it's probably actually the, the real suffering Alan's yes. trying to avoid. Um, I have another one. Um, just going on from the uh, the the Beehive Cuddle stuff, um, the expansion of uh, file system, so so underlying storage into guests. Um, at the moment, you've got to basically shut down the guest and then let, start the guest back up again to to reread the underlying um, geom or or whatever you're presenting as a storage layer. Is there any any work happening in the active pass through of expansion of storage layers? 
So that's the last time I actually talked about this control socket was in the context of that question from folks in the LUMOS about how we propagate disk resize events into Beehive from the outside. And that probably would go over the same Unix domain socket. Actually, I really but, that because currently, like behind, like in the save restore code, that's not all by default. It like calls Mictor and things to like, create the path to Unix domain socket. Um, and there's some trivial things we just need to clean up there. Like we should create var and Beehive and then entry and then stop trying to create the directory inside Beehive. And it's not hard. It's just someone needs to spend some time doing it and testing it. Uh, but you may be able to do that without having that particular thing. So I think. Um... At least on FreeBSC, the Vertio backend already has the file descriptor, so it could just uh, get k events on uh, if there is one for that particular. Oh, th operation. I don't know if there's a k event from Geom. That you... I don't know if there's a k event, but I don't know if there's a way you can listen for the Geom event somehow. Like I don't know if a Geom resize event gets propagated. It might get propagated to Dev Cuddle, which would be not useful. Because it doesn't go to the FD, it's just a string that ends up in DevD. Um, I don't know that there's a way. I mean, that would actually be the nicer thing because then you could do it in the little block interface code in Beehive itself, and then we could have like a block interface callback that can any device model can get a notification and do whatever it needs to notify the guest. Um, I think if you just have a file-based backend, um, you may be able to pick that one up with a K event. Yeah, that would be the like, file. Yeah, I'm sure like a ZFS, like a ZVOL. I don't know if you'll get it in that way. Um, but yeah, yeah. If, if you truncate minus s a file back in, that maybe we can catch that with K, but that's true. And then for a ZVOL, the thing is, it can depend if you're running uh, in the dev mode instead of GM mode for the ZVOL. Uh, like I tend to run my. Zvols that I use in Beehive, specifically in dev mode, so that GM on the host doesn't try to pick up on it when, for example, you write the partition table from inside the guest, and then GM um, on the host is like, hey, you shouldn't be writing to the raw device anymore. Well, usually, my experience is that once Beehive opens it, then GM detaches because it's a writable open, and so they all go away. And then once the VM exits, then you can see it again. It, 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 I think it retastes it then. I think because a writable open forces the other GM consumers to close. I could be wrong. Yeah, I see some ugly D messages uh, for for hosts that have been up for you know months. Um, and if you haven't flicked it over to Dev uh, as Evo mm -hmm. or Dev mode, then you'll you'll actually see some like it just randomly scans and and finds stuff and then errors in the D message. So it does does occur. You just gotta you just gotta be mindful when you're creating those uh Z vols that uh, you flick it over correctly. Interesting. I can ask a question on behalf of Jason. I can ask a question on behalf of Jason. Has the LRO bug been fixed in the um, iflib code yet? So there's a there's a problem in um, the FreeBSD bridge code where um, I guess this is very specific to having a VM guest, but um, offload flags um, don't don't get disabled and propagated down. So Jason found a bug where LRO um, on a VLAN interface um, wasn't being disabled down through the bridge, and then the guests were getting LRO frames. So we have to find a way to, um, firstly, in the, the bridge code itself, when you get a new um, VLAN member. Oh, well, when you, when you get a VLAN that's on a bridge, it has to disable all the offload flags and have that propagated down. So the iflib code itself sees that, um, uh, you know, there's no receive offload. Transmit offload's fine, because the guest isn't going to do it. Um, but the problem was uh, software LRO. Yeah, I think I ran into that problem. I don't think it's iflib specific because I have a bridge, the VLAN, and then the Chelsea interface underneath. And Chelsea is not iflib, is it? No. 
Uh, but no, yeah, the, the bridge kid tries to disable LRO and the VLAN eats that and it never makes it to the Chelsea O and I had to manually disable LRO or have just useless network throughput. Yeah, currently if lib disables LRO if forwarding is enabled, but it also needs to disable it if the flag isn't set on the interface. Yeah, that uh, question came up on the uh, virtualization mail list as well. Somebody was uh, had, uh, uh, what was it, um, tanking. Actually, I don't know if that was the virtualization mail list or Twitter, uh, but somebody was doing some Linux performance testing and their their traffic was tanking in one direction. It was just, oh, yeah, those hallmarks. And it was just like, yeah, flick off LRO. Um, I, there was no clear communication if that they were using VLANs or not in this case or what sort of um, adapter that they were using. But um, yeah, once they switched LRO off there, they had full, full bandwidth both directions. Yeah, that's currently the, that that is the workaround is just to manually disable it on the base interface, um, but um, it's done automatically um, for non VLAN interfaces. It just has to be fixed for VLANs. I did work out why I wasn't having it in eleven, and that's because LRO isn't enabled by default in eleven, but it is in twelve. That reminds me. I'm looking to see if I can find them. I believe some of the folks working on NetMap things with Beehive, I thought somebody maybe got committed. There is some stuff to allow tap devices to basically do LRO and TSO in and out of the guest, which helps. I mean, it's a, that's a separate orthogonal issue, but maybe that got committed. Oh, nope. If I can paste this in all the right places. That's one of them. So this is a set of, there's a several set of changes, but they have to do with basically allowing you to do large frames in and out of the guest so you can get more bang to, you know, amortizing a little bit of the cost of shuffling data in and out of the guests. Although it has, he has a blocking review at the end. So I don't know what the current status of this is. You know, I think there's a couple of things that could also be done outside of the kernel or maybe a combination. So we could support soft TSO inside Beehive itself. Mm -hmm. um, Linux actually has a really nice API for that that could be kind of copied. And the other thing is um, our NetBSD has a send multiple message system call. So the things you want to avoid are um, VM exits and system calls. So having T TSO just avoids, avoids the multiple VM exits on a per packet basis. And doing, doing soft um, TSO is not hugely compute expensive. And then having a send multiple message allows you to, to still continue to use things like TAP or some other simple datagram backend um, without having to have a system call on every uh, packet that's sent. So I wasn't sure why previously you didn't have send M, mess, M message. I, thought, yeah, I guess it's a very arcane use case. I thought it did. Um, oh, go ahead, Mark. I'm, I mean, we have a send a message man page at least. Um, yeah, but did they do it in libc? Like, I feel like, uh, I don't remember. I don't know if it's an actual system call. Uh, FreeBSD apparently has one in Libc. I don't know. Which defeats the, the purpose of what we want. Because uh -huh. then you're back to doing a system call for per message, which oh, okay. I see. if you just do a loop in user land. Yes. OK, that should be fairly easy to implement. Yeah, yeah there's, some, there's some issues like you know when if you get an error on one of those, where do you return it? But 
I think it's been in FBSD long enough that um, maybe that's a, a good code base to look at. That's, is it not in positive? Oh, I don't know. Oh, that's a good question. Oh, it doesn't seem to. Even without TSO, I think that's useful because um, with third IO on transmit often uh, Linux will gather up a number of um, transmit frames before doing the kick. And I guess on receive as well. I mean, on a tab, if there's multiple frames queued up, if you just did a, if there's a receive end message you could pull in as many as there are available just in one system call rather than sitting there polling until uh, you get back a, um, an error message. Yeah, it looks like in Linux, they were, the bugs does exist and it's useful for quick of all things. Um, I got another one. Um, it's one that we've actually worked on, Peter. Um, it was around the uh, checksum uh, issue that we noticed uh, OpenBSD has, but other operating systems don't have when using netmap veil. Yeah, so just a bit of background on that. Um, netmap veil, um, the backend in Beehive, uh, implements TSO and LRO, but it assumes that it's only talking to another netmap veil. So it basically doesn't do any checksumming at all. A TSO frame just gets, data gets moved to the other end or to the destination port on the bridge and gets accepted as an LRO frame, but um, no checksumming has been done. Uh, so the issue there is uh, on um, OpenBSD, firstly, they don't, uh, do LRO and secondly um, they verify every received checksum they don't take any notice of the vert IO uh, checksum bit in the header and the thing is that checksum is actually incorrect because it has never been checksum so it would fail like if you did a TCP dump um, even on a normal frame you would see that um, the checksum is bad but they indicate that the checksum is correct in vert IO um, so it, you could say that's a bug in OpenBSD where they should blindly accept the status of the checksum bit. Um, they do, for example, on Intel Ethernet adapters. Um, but um, it's the only operating system where that's an issue. Um, everybody else uh, accepts the VertIO header checksum bit. Um, but for Jason's use case, where he actually really wants to use OpenBSD in a high performance networking scenario, that doesn't work very well. Um, so the only way I can see that working is if we modify um, Vale to have a, um, to force a checksum to be calculated on a per port basis. The checksumming itself, I think is not, not really that much of an overhead anymore. I mean, you can kind of see it if you enable or disable it on a 10 gig interface, it doesn't really make, it makes maybe, you know, less than 1% difference. Um, so that may not be too much of an overhead. All right, well, maybe if we don't get any more questions um, in a few minutes, we could wrap this up at say quarter past the hour. Sure. Seems like we're short of content today, going an hour and 15 minutes. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe that's something for the future. We'll have uh, 
less less at the start and maybe more Q and A. But then again, I guess it's a chicken and egg. We need um, need to get people to watch it to get people to ask questions. Um, there also yeah, wasn't a whole, whole lot of advance notice. So in the future, you know, we'll probably have a week or maybe two weeks notice before. Um, the, um, yeah, what I would like to do is, is figure out a way to start collecting questions ahead of time. Uh, so that when you, when you get started with the Q&A, you can mix in live stuff that does come in, but have some questions collected from before as well. Because, uh, you know, that's often what we found to be the, the most engaged of these office hours is, is answering people's questions. It's just, you know, it makes for better viewing if you have a nice steady stream of questions. <laughs> and yeah, also, um, I was going to um, probably try to get some demos. I mean, it's quite good seeing the old VNC versus the new VNC. It's actually very noticeable um, in how much it's improved. Um, and maybe running up uh, some guests live showing people uh, you know what a windows install looks like for example yeah i've never actually seen a windows 10 install oh well, there you go so there'll, there'll be something new for you okay oh maybe another 30 seconds for questions anybody out there has any quick send them in We answer Michael Dexter's one. It's in the IRC. Oh, there's a review I posted last week, but no one's, no one who wanted the change has looked at it. So. Okay. So I um, think we'll. Um, do a wrap on this. Um, my hope is to try to do this uh, once a month. Um, maybe that's too short, maybe that's too long, I'm not sure, but uh, we'll see how it goes in the future. Um, all right, well, thanks everybody for um, showing up. And um, hopefully in a month, uh, we can do this again. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks. Cheers. All right. Bye. Thanks a lot.